it's a pleasure to be here um, and to see all this enthusiasm for space and space exploration. Today I'm going to be talking about a vision for Canadian space exploration that a group of us have been working on over the past year or so and to give you uh, my personal motivation for supporting space exploration in Canada and also a vision for how to move it forward. So first of all, I am a scientist, I'm an astronomer, I study supermassive black holes, so I just want to give you a sense of what science does for you when you're going out into space. So this is a table that shows you some of the specifications of the Hubble Space Telescope compared to the James Webb Space Telescope. And it, I just want to give you a sense of how much better the James Webb Space Telescope, how much more powerful, how much more sensitive it's going to be than the Hubble Space Telescope. So the first big thing is that the mirror is way bigger. So you go from a 2.4 meter mirror to a 6.5 meter mirror. Mirrors are basically light buckets. And so the bigger the light bucket, the more light you can capture, the more sensitive you are. And JWST is seven times, has seven times more area than the Hubble Space Telescope. It's also going to be collecting light at different wavelengths, at longer wavelengths allows it to probe further back in time and also to look at things that are buried behind clouds of dust and gas. The orbit of the James Webb Space Telescope is in the second Lagrange point, which means that it's in a solar orbit as opposed to an orbit that goes around the Earth. The Hubble Space Telescope, because it was lower, in low Earth orbit, it meant it could be serviced, but it also meant that half the time the Earth was in the way. And so it's not a very efficient place to put a telescope if you actually want to look at space. Um, and then finally, because all of these, this combination of powers together, the huge area, the wavelength sensitivity, the updates and instruments, it means that we can go from looking at young galaxies with the Hubble Space Telescope, which basically took a month of the Hubble Space Telescope staring at a part of the sky um, <coughs> to find the youngest galaxies. With the James Webb Space Telescope, we're going to be able to look at the very first stars, so much earlier in time before galaxies have even formed. And I just want to, wanted to spend some time with this to give you a sense of how hard the science pushes the technology. Because if you are doing this, some sort of commercial application, making something 20% better would probably be good enough. But it's not good enough for the science. We want it to be 10 times better and 100 times better. And so we really push the technology um, in a way that there aren't um, a lot of other endeavors that would do that. So I want to talk a little bit more about the James Webb Space Telescope <clears throat> and what Canada's role in it is. So we have um, two instruments. We're contributing two instruments to the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, the fine guidance sensor and the near infrared and slitless spectrograph. Um, the lead is Rene Doyon at the University of Montreal. And so we are key partners in this endeavor. So you can see that the CSA is on the badge, or on the patch, um, along with NASA and ESA. And as a result of our contributions, we have a role in the governance of the James Webb Space Telescope. We are going to also be involved in archiving the data at the Canadian Astronomical Data, data Center. Um, and as a result, we get 5% of the science data. That's what we care about. That's why we did it. And I just want to give you a taste of what that access does. So here is an image on the left-hand side. You have a Hubble Space Telescope image of a star cluster, which is called 47 Decanae. And a star cluster is an object in our galaxy that has about 100,000 to a million stars in it. And it's very old, and they were all born at the same time. On the right-hand side is a simulation of a very small section of a James Webb Space Telescope image of that same star cluster. And you can see there's little blue dots and little red dots, and those mark the white dwarfs, which are the cinders of stars like our sun, what's left over at the end of um, the life of a star like our sun, and brown dwarfs, which are tiny stars that are not massive enough to actually fuse hydrogen. And that's the number of those sorts of objects that are expected to be found with just five hours of JWST time. Detecting those brown dwarfs would take 60 times longer with the James Webb Space Telescope. So it's going to enable um, amazing studies into the history of star formation in our galaxy in a fraction, a tiny, tiny fraction of the time that the Hubble Space Telescope would, would be able to do. 
So this is an example of us participating in an ambitious and exciting international mission. But within the Canadian space community, we also we have ambitions to lead our own projects. And so this is an example of one that has been um, considered, which is called CASTOR. It has a fabulous acronym for Canadians. Um, and so it stands for the Cosmological Advanced Survey Telescope for Optical and Ultraviolet Research. And this would be an ultraviolet imager that would scan the sky and take deep, deep pictures in the ultraviolet. You have to be above the atmosphere in order to observe the universe in the ultraviolet. Um, and what ultraviolet allows you to do is look at young stars, growing supermassive black holes, and white dwarfs. The, this is a proposal, um, which would be a flagship mission led by Canada, and recently there was a proposal that went in um, just, this, just last month to do a science maturation study. Um, in order to see if this is a feasible project, you need to do the appropriate cost estimate and then decide whether or not this is going to be something that we actually want to invest in. But I just want to illustrate it as an example for the ambition and the excellence of the Canadian community that we have the capability to do something like this, to lead an international mission, that, uh, to lead a, a mission that the international community is very, very intrigued by. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to talk a little bit about what the status of the space exploration agenda is currently in Canada. So about a year ago, um, there was a meeting of, called the Canadian Space Exploration Workshop in November of 2016 in Montreal um, that a lot of astronomers and planetary scientists and industry people and CSA participated in as a way of thinking about in a broad scope where we want to go with our space exploration agenda. Um, and the consensus after this, I was involved in the science part of it, so um, uh, we had groups that presented um, space astronomy missions. <coughs> space exploration within the Canadian Space um, Agency includes space astronomy, planetary science, and also space health. I'm an astronomer, so I'm most familiar with space astronomy, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. The consensus after this um, space exploration workshop was basically that there were two things, there were two issues. One was that there were not enough resources to realize our ambitions, our scientific ambitions. And the second problem was that there's no established process for making, for making these happen. So even if the resources were available, there's no sort of established mechanism, no process by which you would decide how to allocate them. So I just want to demonstrate where Canada fits within other countries in terms of resources that are allocated for space exploration. So here's a chart. This is from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And on the x-axis there, you have the fraction of the gross domestic product that goes into space exploration. And you can see on this chart, Canada is ranked about 15th. So, and this is from 2009. Since then, our ranking will have slipped. You can see that we're behind Luxembourg, um, which is sort of appalling. And the, um, but I want to say that this is also what's really shocking is that we are a partner in the James Webb Space Telescope, which one is one of the most exciting international missions that's coming along. So we have this legacy of excellence, both scientific and technical, um, despite this very low investment in space, um, space exploration. But that legacy, which is bearing fruit now, is because of investments that happened 10, 15, 20 years ago. And that is just going to completely go away if we don't continue to make new investments. The other thing that's happening because we do not have enough resources <coughs> is that we are losing our talent. So this is um, Nevin Vulich, who is um, a PhD student of mine who graduated last year um, with his two supervisors, myself and my colleague Pauline Barbie. And Nevin did an awesome thesis using Chandra X-ray Observatory where he took basically a million seconds worth of observations and made the deepest, most sensitive catalog of X-ray sources ever made of the Andromeda galaxy. Because of his excellent thesis work and his experience in X-ray astronomy, he was snapped up um, by, by NASA, the Goddard Space Flight Center. And so Nevin has an awesome job, and I'm so proud of him. Um, and, but it's such a shame that he had to leave the country to continue doing his work because there were no options for him in Canada. There's no, um, there aren't jobs basically for scientists after they get their PhDs within Canada, very, very few jobs. And so um, we are losing our talent to other countries because we don't have the resources to retain them. So 
Um, as I mentioned, we had these two um, conclusions from the Canadian Space Exploration Workshop that we did not have enough resources to realize our ambitions, and also that there was no established process for making them happen. So <clears throat> then, of course, the question is, okay, what do you do about it? So I'll tell you what we did about it. So this is something that um, after this meeting, um, there were a couple of astronomers who got together and we said, okay, what are we going to do? What are we going to do about this? this? The situation is what it is, and we want to do something about it. So, Alaria Piazzo is the picture of, the, of her on her left, and then Jeremy Heil. So, Jeremy is a, um, he's an astronomer at University of British Columbia, and Alaria is a PhD student who's working with him. And so, we took this tweet from uh, Minister Baines to heart. And so, um, there's even a bad astronomy pun in there. So, um, and so, we contributed our idea about how you could move forward with space exploration. So what we did was we um, started meeting, we drafted a document, which was a vision for Canadian space exploration, which is a white paper, it's available um, publicly. We solicited um, feedback from the topical team leaders, the scientific leaders who had contributed to the Canadian space exploration. We solicited comments from industry experts and people at the Canadian Space Agency, and we made it publicly available and are still soliciting comments. And so we put this out here in terms of a motivation for investing in Canadian space exploration um, and also a mechanism, a process for if we had the resources, how, um, how we could develop the process. So in terms of what actually happens now for deciding missions, um, the current process is that instruments um, are typically have a university lead um, and then they're built in an industrial lab. And um, so some of the industrial partners for these satellites, so the James Webb Space Telescope, AstroSat, and Hitomi. Um, so Comda, which is now Honeywell, is a, part, is a partner, as well as ABB. Um, there's some proposals going in from Honeywell and Magellan, and NEPTEC contributed to, um, to Hitomi. So these are industrial partners that we have been, we as the astronomy community have been working with for a long time to make these, um, make these contributions. And then there's something which is called the, um, the CASCA CSA Joint Committee on Space Astronomy. That's a committee between the CSA and CASCA, which is the Professional Society for Astronomers in Canada. And I served on that committee and we advised CSA basically on how, um, on what we recommend in terms of being the exciting investments in the future. Um, in future space astronomy. So this is sort of what's happening now, but it's not sufficient for um, if we had a serious injection of resources and actually making big projects happen. And certainly we don't want this to be how decisions are made, right? We don't want a bunch of people sitting around behind closed doors, um, you know, trading cars and deciding, trading cards and deciding who gets um, who gets the, the money injection. And so this is not a good process. Um, and an example of a process that has been very effective um, that we in the astronomical community um, follow is what's called the long range plan in astronomy. So this is where every 10 years the astronomical community gets together and this is organized by our professional society. And we have a committee who's in charge of it. They are um, experts from diverse scientific fields from across the country that represent our community. Um, and they have a consultation. We have town halls, people submit white papers. It's a months long process. It's incredibly labor intensive. It's a huge amount of work. We get broad consultation from the community. There is a draft then of uh, our goals, our priorities as a community that gets circulated and people can feed back. Um, and then once it's adopted, then there's an implementation committee, and every five years we revisit it to see how things have changed in the, in the new international landscape. So this is a process that for us as a community has been incredibly effective because we get together, we consult with the community, and we decide what we as a community care about, and then we go ahead and we try to get it. We try to lobby for our priorities. So this is a process that's been um, that is effective um, and is something to keep in mind when we think about how our next process would be. So if we're talking about space exploration, the goals for a space exploration process that would basically nurture a vibrant space exploration um, community, you want to have announcements of opportunity that are regular and predictable. This is particularly essential for industry so that they can plan for it. You don't want to surprise people. 
Um, they should be able to plan for it. Decisions should be peer-reviewed and the process should be transparent. This builds legitimacy into the process and, um, and fairness so that everyone feels that there's a level playing field. You want to have multiple funded steps for down selection. When you are designing a science mission, they are really hard and often the technology has to be developed to make happen what you want to happen. So you need to fund, fund different projects along the way um, so that they can get to a point where you can actually make good decisions. And it's also important that when funding happens, you don't just provide funding to build stuff, but also to operate it and also to exploit it for the science, which is the whole reason that people do these projects. And reviews um, should also be done along the way. So in our white paper, we have many more details about a possible process for making decisions about um, space and exploration missions. And I want to give Olaria um, credit for this. She's the one who went out and did the research and looked at different processes internationally um, and pulled together, designed something that was appropriate for our community context. So <clears throat> when we think about why you would go through all this effort, I want to talk about why you should support Canadian space exploration. And I'm going to take advantage of the XKCD flowchart um, uh, as, a, as a way of explaining it. So in general, if you're interested in growing our knowledge economy, creating good jobs in Canada, space is an awesome place to invest. It's a healthy, healthy space program creates great jobs. And you do not have to take my word for it. There is a, a long document that was put together by the Aerospace Industries Association of Canada, which makes this argument about how useful and productive investment in space is in terms of growing, <coughs> excuse me, the knowledge economy and creating great jobs for Canadians. But um, so this is why this is one reason for being invested in space exploration and thinking it's worth um, the investment. But that's not why I'm interested in space exploration. I'm a scientist. I want to understand how black holes grow. That's something that motivates me. And if you want to understand the universe, if you're curious about where we come from in a very global sense, you have to get above the atmosphere because there are questions you just cannot answer from the ground. Um, and this is just an example of how important this is. Here are some pictures from the solar eclipse at Western University. We had 5,000 people come to Western to see the solar eclipse. And as you can see, we had grandmothers and we had kids and we had telescopes. And it was just, it was fabulous. It was a party. Everybody there had so much fun. They were so <laughs> excited to see the solar eclipse within this community. And, and this is, I mean, getting people excited about astronomy is like shooting fish in a barrel. I have yet to meet a third grader who was not excited to talk to me about, about black holes. And so this is my motivation. This is why I'm a scientist. And this is really important. <clears throat> this is often why people decide to study science, because they were excited about astronomy as a kid. <clears throat> and putting these two things together, the sort of um, the uh, innovation thing and also the outreach thing and the inspiration thing is something that we're doing at Western. We have a Center for Planetary Sci Science and Exploration um, where both of these two motivating factors for space exploration are brought together. Um, so we have the um, research that's happening at Western where these are our sort of main um, research themes. In the CPSX we have um, we have uh, astronomers, we have planetary scientists, we have engineers, we have geographers, we have people in the health sciences, people who are interested in, in space law. So it's a very robust, vibrant, interdisciplinary community. And we also have a very active outreach program where we have podcasts and space camp and summer outreach all the time. And so both of those things are happening at the same time and it's a very dynamic, exciting community. I would say if there's any students in the audience, um, we have an excellent graduate program, um, and we have a, and all, there's also professional programs that are it's that are very exciting. I'd be happy to talk to you. So in general, in terms of why you should support Canadian space exploration, I'm just going to leave you with this slide um, because. It's good for Canada, and it's in terms of developing our knowledge economy and growing it in a really positive way. 
Um, and also, we want as Canadians to be involved in this endeavor. It's exciting. It's 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 sort of. I mean, humans are cur curious creatures. It's in our nature to try to understand our world. Um, and so I think, um, and space basically is awesome. So thank you.